Hello and welcome to the very first episode of Spotlight, a diary for the South East brought to you by Round and About magazine. I'm Angela Walker and I'll be bringing you this indispensable guide to where to go and what to do in the South East of England. I've got some fantastic guests joining me in the studio. We'll be hearing from AJ and Curtis Pritchard of Strictly Come Dancing and Love Island fame. They're here to talk about their incredible new stage show. We always perform as though it's the last time we're ever going to dance. So mm. we give our audience, like, they've paid harder money to come and watch us and be entertained. Then there's this. What show are you in, Wagner? Ah. Is this the first time you've performed on stage? Ah. Plus, the best food the region has to offer and some amazing competitions. Coming up, I'll be joined by Liz Nichols, who'll be walking us through the region's top events and stay with us to hear from Olympic swimmer and one of TV's original gladiators, it's Sharon Davies. But first, do you fancy a weekend away? I know I do. Stay with us and you could win one. You could win a stay for two at Minster Mill in the Cotswolds. Not only that, you'll get a three course meal and breakfast. It's stunning. The mill was built in the 1400s in Whitney, just outside Oxford. So if you fancy winning a trip to Minster Mill, stay with us and find out how later in the programme. And we'll also be giving away some theatre tickets. And Chef Paul Clearhue will be joining us in the studio today and he's bringing some food. Without further ado though, I'd like to welcome Liz Nichols from Round and About magazine to join me in the studio and walk us through the very best events in the region this summer. Liz, thank you so much for joining us. Hello. Now, there's so much going on. It must have been a nightmare whittling it down. So what have you got for yeah, us? There's so much to cram in. A wonderful one for the whole family which I believe that you've taken part in before, is the big butterfly count to take the nature's pulse and help uh, day flying moths and butterflies. Um, and that's between the 12th of July and the 4th of August. And there's a lot that families can get involved with and there's a free app that you can download to find out what the different species look like and how to help them in your own space. Amazing. Some... Yeah, we love the big butterfly count. I've done that with my daughter for like the last few years and it's a good excuse to sit down in the sun basically for 20 minutes or so and just uh, and just count the butterflies that's what we do isn't it so how does it work Liz what do people have to do so if you download the free app from Big Butterfly Count's website then that will give you the identifiers and it's the largest citizen science project um, that the country has I believe and it's been going such a long time and it's, it's really helpful to record how the different species are doing and help them because they are under threat yeah, I mean, I know it's fun sitting around, you know, watching the butterflies, but there is a really serious message behind it, isn't there? Uh, let's have a listen to what Chris Packham has to say. It would be much easier if it were just one thing, because we could fix that one thing and the problem would go away. But it isn't. On top of everything, we've got climate change. We know that this is playing a role. We're seeing changes in the distribution of these insects over time, which certainly tie in with changes in our climate. But then alongside that, we've got industrial agriculture, widespread use of pesticides, and we know that that is having a very, very significant impact. On top of that, we've got urbanisation. We've got people putting down fake grass and, and patios, doing away with their, their lawns and borders, which were once you know, great places for some of our commoner suburban and urban butterflies. It's so sad that we're seeing a decline. Um, what can we do? Tell us more about the app. Yeah, so the app, the app and the website will also tell families exactly what they can plant in their space even if they've just got a window box you know or a big garden lots of pollinating plants to help attract the butterflies and keep them we've had a warm wet spring but you know we don't know what summer's going to hold so they need all the help they can get really now this next one's going to be a huge hit another one of david walliams's books is being brought to life i'm so excited about this tell us a bit more yeah it's his fourth book all full auntie and I'm not going to give any spoilers because it does look great, but there's a ghost, a killer owl and a car chase. And uh, <laughs> so there's lots to accept. And David Williams has been popping up in theatres as, as the tour's been going on. Um, so he'll probably make a surprise appearance. So after Woking, it's going to go to, well, all around the country, including Waterside Theatre in Aylesbury in September. Amazing. Yeah. And that awful auntie, she's truly awful and horrible, isn't she? <laughs> so let's have a sneak preview. I'm here with my friend Soot. He's a ghost. What do you mean he's a ghost? There's nobody there. She's deluded. Come and 
Nancy, awful auntie. Uh, no, Wagner, what are you doing? Go away, this is my video. If you want to see us all in awful auntie, then come to your theatre. We'll see you soon. Now, there's another theatre production that's very much on my radar, and it's The Tiger Who Came to Tea. It is. It's by Judith Kerr. We think we all read it to our little ones, didn't we? It's iconic. And it's back at the Theatre Royal in Haymarket um, from the 8th of July until the 1st of September. Um, we've actually got a Q&A with Judith Kerr who, from 2019. She, di she died at the age of 95, so that's the last interview that she gave. And we've teamed up with the Theatre Royal to offer a family ticket and some goodies as well. So how can people win those tickets? So if they go to roundandabout.co.uk. It's hard to believe it's true, but it happened to me and you. We just opened the door and what did we see? The tiger who came to tea. Can't wait to go and see it with my yeah, family. Gorgeous. Now, I know we're spoilt for choice when it comes to music festivals in the South East. There is so much going on. Uh, what are your top festivals this year, Liz? Yeah, so many. I mean, Henley Festival is the only black tie festival that's always good. Um, so that's from the 10th to the 14th of July, and you can still, if you're quick, get tickets for that. Nicole Scherzinger um, on the Wednesday, opening up, and then Dave from the Eurythmics. You've also got Gladys Knight, Rylan, Trevor Nelson. And it's very smart and bougie. It's good for people watching. Good oh, and it's food. so fun, isn't it? Because you can pop on your cocktail dress, really get doled up, let yeah. your hair down. There's loads of different music and food. Mm. It's just such a fabulous oh, like, yeah. night out, isn't oh, it? But Stowaway in north of Bucks uh, from the 16th to 18th of August has got Groove Armada, Left Field, Lake Swimming, Bushcraft for the kids, and then Wilderness is my personal fave. 1st to the 4th of August. Uh, this year they've got Michael Kiwanuka, Bjorn again, um, and loads of banqueting and hot tubs in the lake and Ooh, well-being. And it's the last ever Tower Sea. They've just announced that the, the 60th event is actually going to be the last. Oh, that's so, sad um, news. Why is yeah. that? It's just very hard after COVID and, you know, just to make ends meet. It's, it's, it, we go and have fun, don't we? But mm. actually the people behind the scenes work so hard to make it all come together and if you just can't quite sell enough tickets then uh yeah but billy brags at tower c and i'm going to speak to him hopefully next week and have a chat brilliant yeah. brilliant and so after a, a summer of uh, of activity and music festivals what can we do to like wind down then liz well one a great discovery i made recently very lucky to go to b spa which is at brooklands in weybridge quite a historic place it's also where mercedes-benz uh, trackers so you can sit in B Spa they've uh, spent a significant sum of money on that and what the highlight for me is the sunlight therapy so while it's raining outside you've got the cars going round and you can sit on the beach and you can have all the benefits of sunshine vitamin D amazing without any of the harmful rays an well. indoor, beach indoor beach with indoor sun with indoor I'm sun. there I'm there yeah, yeah let's go let's <laughs> sounds go back sounds brilliant it sounds brilliant Thank you so much, Liz. Thank There's you. so much going on in the area. Thanks for talking to us about it. Now, if you're a Love Island or Strictly Come Dancing fan, you're going to love our next guests. Liz called up with AJ and Curtis Pritchard to find out about their new Moulin Rouge stage show. And AJ has some financial tips for you. Welcome to the greatest show on earth. We're excited to be on tour um, through September and October and doing a show that is like the ultimate tribute to Moulin Rouge and other fantastic musicals. For us, like sometimes the hardest thing is like, how do you create a, a storyline? How do you create music that's already got emotion and a story that connects to people? So being able to kind of like already start with something fantastic and be like, okay, we'll just, we'll just add more value. We'll create fantastic routines. We'll choreograph the dances. We'll do some big group numbers, some more solo numbers. Like... It's, it's really nice, and, and for me, Come What May is, like, Moulin Rouge is my favourite musical. I can't... Oh, I was going to ask not you that. Yeah. have a favourite, but personally, it's my favourite. Everyone mm. knows it. That's what's good about Moulin Rouge. They know the big numbers, they know the big songs, and they love it. So it's got a real grounding to it already. And hopefully yeah. we can do it justice on stage. And it looks so high energy. It's so fabulous. How do you keep That's your energy? How do you keep always. your energy up? 
A lot of um, audience. Actually, yeah, audience. I'm going to say it is the audience. I, I can't explain the feeling you get. The adrenaline that a live audience gives you when you're on stage is phenomenal. Whether you are sick to the bone, that energy and that electric that you get on there just keeps you going from start to finish. And then when you finish it, you pass out. You're done. you got to fill your belly with a load of food. Maybe a little beer after. We'll see. But yeah. Do you have a Do you have anything exotic on your riders that you put on there for these different venues? No, actually, we don't really have a rider. Today. No, we're okay. super chill. Yeah. As long as I've water. got water, then the rest I'm pretty happy with. We're right? actually not too bad at that. I, I do listen to some people and I'm like, wow, you asked for all of these things. I'm like, do you even need <laughs> all of that? Thing? No, they never do. They usually just take it home with them afterwards. <laughs> I mean, you could be a real diva about it. That's why I thought you might have some sort of demands, but no, I'm so I, down I to a... I bring all my own stuff because I'm, I'm a bit like, well, if I brought it, then I know I've got it. I don't want to rely on somebody. A kettle, that'll make me happy. I can make myself a coffee. I can make myself a mint tea after the show, I'm sorted. <laughs> oh, good for you. That's why everyone loves you because you're so down to earth. And I need to know, will any of the Strictly judges be coming along? And would that oh, make you nervous? They would definitely have an invite. And no, I, that won't make me nervous. The thing is with these Seven. people, they're all <laughs> just good happy people i think that's really the one thing with strictly like it's 20 year 20 year anniversary this year like which is madness because mm. when a show is so positive like well it makes people happy and the thing with us going on tour and being able to take the tour to the people wherever you are in the uk um that's one thing that we also love like a lot of time our friends and family are like okay you're doing a pantomime in swansea or somewhere usually quite far away than stoke on trent or somewhere close to our, our family home. So these tours mean that we get to go to everybody. There's no excuse. Yeah. So everyone has to be there because it's right next to us. Manchester, everyone has to be there because it's right next to us. <laughs> it looks amazing. Perfect timing as well. If we're not going to have a summer, you know, cheer people up. <laughs> <laughs> and as brothers, you must have been your mum's absolute dream. You see, Have you always got on? Yeah, we've always pretty got much, on to be fair. Yeah, pretty some, much. some good fights, but you should just determine. <laughs> and when I say absolute dream, we have literally tied them out and used up all their money in our dancing career. Oh. <laughs> so swings and roundabouts. Well, they must be, they are so proud. I know they are. No, it's, it's really nice that we both kind of like get to perform and do things that for me, it's like when you get to do like shows and these tours, like you video something, that you document it, it's there for the rest of the time. It creates that history. And that's what I really appreciate. And that's probably why we always perform as though it's the last time we're ever going to dance. So mm. we give our audience, like, they've paid harder money to come and watch us and be entertained fundamentally. So we make sure we give them everything, every drop of energy. So that's why I usually power nap in just before the show. So I'm ready, fully charged to go. Do you like a nap? Do you like a little power nap? I love a power nap. Yeah. And I think it's the most important thing. Like, within the entertainment industry, you never know when you have time to rest and rest is the most valuable thing especially when you're physically like traveling up and down the country and, and performing at your maximum to so rest is priority number one rest mm. and make sure you eat food yeah <laughs> let's go are you looking good on it do you have to insure any different body parts or are you all good well are your legs um, insured i mean if there's a bit of um six pack coming out somewhere um look at aj <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on mine now. <laughs> <laughs> and that brings me to Love Island as Ooh, that's coming up. I'm wondering. Back if you, on, isn't it? Yeah. Have you got any advice for anyone sort of going on, both of you? Yeah. Are singles? I mean, all of these TV shows is just like be yourself. Like the one thing for us, like even you just said then, like like in, regarding the riders, do you have certain opinions or things you want? Well, like all I want to do is be treated the same way that I'd want somebody else to treat be treated like it's it's like it seems so simple but just be nice enjoy what you're doing like we get to do some fantastic opportunities we're going on tour for this we do pantomime again at the end of the year we love what we do we smile if somebody wants a photo if somebody asks you politely we're never going to say no maybe if we've got a whole mouthful of food maybe just give me two minutes i just need to wolf my food down yeah but yeah just be happy be yourself i would say it's exactly that just go on there and be yourself don't try and recreate an argument, recreate this or that, and try and cause anything. Be organic. Be yourself. That's when the best memes, the best and situations are created. If you're on camera 24-7, like SAS and Hunted, like these shows and I'm a sub, you're in, on camera 24-7, in bed, shooter, you can't keep on that up and act for that long. If you're not yourself, people will know. They'll read into it. Just, just yeah. be organic. It's the best way. And, and therefore, then you can actually enjoy the process as well. But you're not having to actually think. 
you can go on there and just enjoy. Yeah, that's great advice. And your podcast's amazing. Have you got any sort of dream, even if it's someone who's not, it's not possible, who's no longer with us, a dream guest you'd love to chat to? Well, I, I, I love business people. So yes. Queen, I would have loved to have had oh. her on. That would have been unbelievable. <laughs> I don't yeah, know what they would have talked good. about. Unbelievable, though. It's just, and just, yeah, inspirational people is fantastic. For me, I, I love business and I, I love kind of understanding how to grow and really manage different people in different sectors. So I think on a business wise, Jeff Bezos oh, being diversive really? and really kind of somebody who just says it and makes it happen. Jeff Bezos more than Elon Musk. Really? Yeah. I don't know. I would love to pick Elon Musk's brain, you know, AJ, to see how I it says, but he's just diverse. He? he is very, um, Warren Buffett would be a very cool guy as well to, uh, to pick his brain. Mm. Excellent. And you're very good at helping young people think in a simple way about planning for their future in terms of their money as well. Yeah, no, I think for us, like, we always talk about we're performers, where we love what we do, and but it's always been like, you perform, don't think about the money, don't worry about this side. Whereas that's the wrong attitude for us. It is. We're like we're launching our financial investment app literally now, next week. We're on the App Store and, and Android right now. So it's Fint, F I N T Invest. But at the heart of Fint is is education. And our business partner Wes, who is the founder of Fint and we're co founders, he came to us and kind of hated the way that education was being done and the way that people were being taken advantage of within even cryptocurrency and stuff like this. And really for us at the heart of just setting up good, healthy habits is so important from from day dot. I've always set up a monthly investment since my first paycheck of Strictly. And that's what's allowed me to kind of purchase my own property and, and feel mentally calm. Mm. And I would say one great thing, one great bit of advice to do is Try this for 30 days or even two weeks if you want. Yeah. Write down everything you spend for them two weeks or the 30 days and it will really allow you to understand what yeah. your money can do for you and what you can do yourself. We're really looking forward to seeing you. Thank we you so wait. much. And I hope to see you there as well. Yeah, 100%. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Team GB will be going for gold in Paris this summer for the 2024 Olympic Games. And who better to talk us through the upcoming action than an Olympic swimmer who's been to every Olympics since 1976. Liz Nichols caught up with Sharon Davies. Our men's 4x2 will be defending Olympic champions. Our men's 4x1 freestyle relay will also be, you know, right up there fighting for medals. Um, our mixed medley relay are also defending Olympic champions. Uh, Duncan Scott will be in action. Uh, Tom Dean will be in action. And of course, Adam Peaty is going to be in action. You know, it's good to see Adam back in form again. Uh, we've got two ladies world champions. Um, so they're going to be, you know, looking to, to go in there and, and have a good battle. Although I have to be honest and say that the Americans, the Canadians and the Australians and, and the Japanese and the Chinese are all going to be very, very strong contenders. So it's going to be a little bit tougher for our ladies, I think. But our men's team are, are looking very strong. Um, our last Olympics in Tokyo was the most successful in 100 years. So they've got a lot to live up to. But, you know, we've had a very good, tr good trials um, and I think it will be very exciting. It's going to be fantastic. It's your 13th Olympics, isn't it? Is that right? Yeah, it is. Well, my first Olympics, I was 13. And my last competing Olympics, I was nearly 30. And this will be number 13 in succession. So I've been there since 1976. And they've mm. all been unique and special. Although I have to say Tokyo was quite a challenge. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And may I ask you about gladiators, please, Sharon? Because uh, you were fantastic as Amazon. How do you look back on, on that time now? I mean, it was a fascinating time. I resisted it for a long time because I presented the kids series with Daley Thompson, which was called Train to Win. And the only reason I eventually said yes to Nigel Lithgow was that I was there anyway because my then husband, um, Derek Redmond, was working on the show as a trainer all the time. So I was kind of hanging about just, you know, being there. And it just made sense. I was just really loath to trade in Sharon Davis, Olympic swimmer, to being, you know, Amazon gladiator. But I guess it's just a whole new generation that, that see you for, you know, for, for something else. And, and it was a fascinating time, but then I, I snapped my cruciate ligament in my right knee. So I decided that, um, that it was time to call it a day. And I'd had to look after my bits and pieces because they got to last me a while. <laughs>
Yeah, absolutely. Well, you're looking phenomenal and you're obviously very fit and you have a lot of advice for people about how to start getting fit and healthy, even if they've been a bit scared of that or a bit lazy yeah, throughout their life. Yeah, I've got absolutely, it is absolutely never too late, you know, and the secret with exercise and fitness is that moderation. It's that middle territory, the ability to be able to live with it and to incorporate it into your life forever because you're looking at trying to make changes that are healthy changes you're not trying to you know join up to the gym on day one of january the first and then get fed up of it five weeks later it's about finding things that you enjoy but it's also understanding that it takes about three months to build a habit or to break a bad habit and then when you're eating you know eat colorful try to remove as much beige as you can alcohol is full of calories that we forget about and unfortunately, it's that horrible old thing, processed foods. You know, we've all got very used to them because they're quick and easy, but they are absolutely booby trapped with, with sugar. If we made our own pasta dishes, we would both bung a load of sugar in there. And so it's, it's those hidden calories that we're just not aware of, really. Trying not to eat late is another quite good tip. And understanding that actually going into the gym is maintaining muscle mass and we start to lose muscle when we get to about 35. And of course, it's those muscles that burn calories. So it's a dichotomy when people say, well, my metabolism is slowing down. Well, your metabolism is slowing down because you're losing muscle. So if you want to maintain muscle so that you can eat, which is what I like to do, then you need to, to be in the gym. So there's obviously there's weight training, which will maintain that, you know, that muscle. Then there's doing cardiovascular work, which works on keeping our heart and our lungs um, you know, fit. And then there's things like mobility and yoga and, and calisthenics and getting out in the fresh air. There's all sorts of different things. And ideally, it's about combining all of them. And you've been championing females and female sports people and, and encouraging our girls. And I know that you've been on Twitter again today. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that? The biggest reason I speak out was because my generation had to compete against East Germans who were absolutely topped full of testosterone by the old East German system, you know, which was extremely corrupt. It was a total propaganda move. And those poor girls were, were utter pawns. A lot of the drugs that they gave them made them very, very poorly. In fact, many of them have actually died. But the IFC did absolutely nothing, all, all during that period of time, 20 years of it, and since, to put that right. And obviously, what you were doing was putting young girls through a form of male puberty, but it was still not as strong as actual male puberty. You know, the difference between male and female performance at the Olympics is anywhere between 10% and 30%. So 30% being more explosive events like weightlifting, um, high jump, uh, you know, uh, pole vault, those sort of things. Um, to swimming and long distance running, which is sort of 10 to 12%. But that is absolutely huge. That's, that's more than half the length of the pool. So, you know, what you're giving away is just totally and utterly unfair. And women have such a small part of the cake. We only have 2% of the sponsorship dollar and 4% of, of commercial airtime. So we, you know, we, we really only have a little bit of this massive commercial sports cake. And now we're supposed to move over, you know, for, for males that identify as females. Now, I want everyone to do sport. I've always encouraged that. But first and foremost, I believe that females are entitled to fair and equal opportunities. And this doesn't affect men. You know, trans identifying women do not go in and dominate men's sport. It doesn't happen. In fact, most trans identifying females remain, opt to remain in female races, no matter how they identify. So if they can do that, I don't really understand why, you know, trans identifying men can't do exactly the same. Your book, Unfair Play, has been very well received, hasn't it? So I'd recommend that people read that as well. Yeah, um, no, I mean, it's been shortlisted by the Times and the Telegraph for Sports Book of the Year. And we were shortlisted in the top six in the world by the William Hill Awards last year, which was really cool as well. And it did take a year of my life to write it. And I wanted to put all of the evidence in there and all of the peer reviewed science and all of the history of all the battles of women's sport to say that, you know, this is just yet another hurdle that seems to be chucked in, in the direction of, of female athletes. And just before you have to go, and I'm really thankful again, you love Star Trek because it, it promotes, <laughs> you know, what do you tell me about your love for Star uh, Trek? I suppose it's just one of those funny things that occasionally comes up. You know, people always say, well, you know, what do we, what, what can, thing can you tell us about you that nobody else knows? And I'll always go, well, I'm a Trekkie, you know. The thing, the reason I love Trek, Star Trek is I just love the concept that one day we'll be able to go out there, you know, into the to the the universes and get on with all sorts of different people from all sorts of different races and um, and explore. You know, I, I I love the concept and and I love you know Captain Janeway. She's she's a very feisty <laughs> feminist, so we uh, we're on her side. 
Each month I'll be joined in the studio by one of the country's top chefs and they'll be bringing food. So my guest today is a punk rocker turned chef who couldn't get a bank loan to buy his first restaurant so he got a car loan and used that instead. It's Paul Clare Hugh, owner of The Crooked Billet in Oxfordshire. Hi Paul, thanks for joining us. I absolutely love that story about how you couldn't get a bank loan. Tell us a bit more about that. I'd been playing in the band. Before the band, um, as a kid at school, I washed up in a pub and was promoted to do starters one day. And then when the head chef didn't turn up, I, I was thrown at the deep end and, and did main courses. But I had a school band that was doing quite well as well. So I left school did the band for some years. In the 1980s, punk rock um, was a, a little long in the tooth <laughs> and um, I spent most of my time driving around Britain in a van, earning 70 quid a week, playing one or two shows. Um, so I'd cooked and I'd washed up before. I went to a bank manager and I said, would you lend me the money to buy a, a restaurant with? Um, because I'd like one. Mm. And they pointed out that I might be quite a good punk rock bass guitarist, but my, my talents as a chef, as a restaurateur, as somebody with the knowledge to manage and market a restaurant were, were, were zero. Mm. I went to a different bank and said, would you lend me the money for a Porsche? I've seen <laughs> a second-hand Porsche. Got the car loan money, and with that, I bought the lease on my first restaurant, The Crooked Billet, which is a lovely old pub in Stoke Row near Henley on Thames. Amazing. And the rest, as they say, is history because look <laughs> at you now. Look at you now. And I really love this story that you did the catering at the Crooked Billet for Kate Winslet's wedding. How did that come about? Um, the Winslet family had been uh, big regulars of the Crooked Billet, still are. We've served and cooked for Kate ever since she was a little girl. At the time we did Kate's wedding, she just finished filming Titanic. So it was in the process of being promoted. We were actually the second venue for Kate's wedding. It had to be kept a secret. She didn't want to sell the story to um, Hello or a glossy magazine. Mm. So big hush hush. But the first venue, press got wind of it. Um, so the approach does. Um, I had to keep it a secret. So even my staff didn't know. I just we're, doing a wedding. Mm. Kate didn't want any press at all. The press followed her from the church in Reading to the Crooked Billet. By mid-evening there were helicopters from World Press Brilliant. above the Crooked Billet <laughs> and I, I'm not exaggerating, there must have been a hundred press there, cameras, and Kate said okay one photograph. So she posed outside the front door of the Crooked Billet and above the front door is my name and the crooked billet Stoke Row. She married on a Sunday. The following day, every single newspaper in Great Britain carried that photograph on their front page. Amazing. And my, my takings had sort of stagnated a certain figure <laughs> and I could not market or work out how to take any more than that. We were doing nicely mm. and as a result of Dear Kate, our takings uh, tripled. Um, the, the food that I cooked for Kate, we kicked off talking about fancy food, lobster and foie gras. I said, but Kate, Reading girl, it's not you. Um, I said, God, you're right. And we did bangers and mash. Amazing. I was awarded a trophy uh, from the Master Guild of Butchers for my service to the sausage. Apparently <laughs> sausage sales soared as a result of Kate Winslet's wedding. Amazing. But what's really sad, the marriage didn't last. Kate did approach me to do the next wedding. I uh, offered her a, a discount for second time around, <laughs> but um, um, she declined in the end. Oh, well, I love the way that Kate Winslet and yourself validated the sausage as a, you know, a, a, a wedding breakfast fair. That's just amazing, isn't it? 
proper British food <laughs> and you can't beat a good sausage. That's true, that's true, amazing. So uh, now I want to ask you about seasonal produce because I know that that's something that's really important to you, isn't it? You like to cook local, cook fresh. T tell me about that and, and, and what you've used it in today because you've brought an amazing dish with you today. I love seasonal produce and my guests relish seasonal produce. But I won't spoil a dish by not using something that isn't necessarily local or seasonal. I love capers. Um, something that's seasonal right now um, is, is mackerel. And mackerel and capers work really well together. Mm. Um, mackerel also works with another ingredient which I'll talk about in a second. But I'm very happy to use an ingredient that may not be seasonal or local um, if it really supports a dish. Mm. I guess we'd be so limited if we only ate seasonal. So maybe it's just about getting a balance, really. Of course it is. I've brought along today um, a, a gooseberry crumble. Oh, it smells amazing, by the way. <laughs> um, so gooseberries, gooseberries and mackerel. Now there's a marriage that's just beautiful. I would never have put those ingredients together. Ah, it's a very old-fashioned British combination. Is it? Is yeah. It? Oh. Gooseberries ripen just in time for spring mackerel, and way back to the 1700s, um, we were marrying gooseberries with mackerel. Um, they'd either make a ketchup with it, so for a gooseberry ketchup, you'd you you'd, you'd uh, braise gooseberries down with a little butter and make a smooth sauce, or you just bung some gooseberries on the skillet with the mackerel oh. and just let them break down. And you know, mackerel is quite rich and oily and the acidity of gooseberries really cuts through that. And we love gooseberries, or I love gooseberries. Yeah. Um, very short season, um, you get the translucent, very acidic gooseberries, and they're good for cooking, and the delicious, plump sweet fat eaters and they've all got that um, um, wiry hair on them like a um, pubescent teenage boy's <laughs> face just before his first shave <laughs> I, I love that and gooseberries have got great names um, you've got uh, whitesmiths um, one called Wynum's Industry I mean what a name for a piece of fruit um, you know, with apples, we you know you've got jazz apples or Granny Smiths. But, mm, should I have a, a, a <laughs> should I have a, a Wynum's Industry go gooseberry today? This is Wynum's Industry gooseberry, and it's a crumble. Mm, I love a crumble. I've got a gooseberry bush in my garden, and they're very small. They're kind of like a red colour actually. Uh, which I didn't realise un until it started fruiting because I always thought gooseberry was, well, you know, green. Mm. But I guess there's a, a, a huge variety of varieties. Yeah, that uh, most of the coloured ones are the sweet eaters. And um, I suspect that, although it's a pinky red colour, mm. I suspect it's a white smith. I think that's the uh, variety of it. Okay. So some of them you can just eat like grapes or strawberries. Yes, we do eat them straight off the bush. Yeah. I've not had a, a big enough harvest yet to to make a crumble. <laughs> yeah. Maybe in a few years' time I will. So, sh shall we try it then, Paul? Oh, please, yeah. This so, looks just stunning. Well, look at that. Look at that crust. So that's rough pebbles of crumble, the colour of digestive biscuits. And I love the way that around the perimeter, all the juices bubble up um, dark claret golden. Mm. Let's have it a little like taste. It looks like caramelised. Yeah, mm. well it is. Mm. It just smells so good. And of course, the perfect accompaniment to gooseberry crumble would be custard sauce. Oh. Thick yellow custard. How do you make your custard? Right, here is a guilty secret. Is it from a tin? Nope. <laughs> I'm a chef and I worship ingredients and I don't care Ooh, what the provenance of the ingredient is, well I do if it's certainly with meats and fish, but with custard. My favourite custard is Tetra Pak 
custard. <laughs> and Angie, I would quite happily sit in a quiet lay-by on a country road with nobody watching, <laughs> cut open the top of a tetra, the tetra pack of custard and eat that. This is sacrilege. This is sacrilege. It's not. It's, <laughs> it's absolutely beautiful. This looks gorgeous. I, I, I would argue that crumble is, uh, gooseberry crumble is the only pudding you could actually eat on the most scorched of summer patios. It works in the summer, um, apple crumble, in the autumn, in the winter. Even bad crumble is good. It's very hot, by the way. It looks quite hot. There's a steam coming off it. Oh, is well, it if I put some oh, custard yes. on, that would some custard just... On. Oh, lovely. There we go. Oh, look at that. That's beautiful. And is it just gooseberries in it or is there another fruit in there with it? Right, it's just gooseberries. I, I, I mm. will share the recipe online. Um, classically, Ooh, that is you, you would put um, sugar with the gooseberries. A nice trick, elderflower has the most perfect affinity with gooseberry. Mm. So when you make a gooseberry crumble, Instead of putting caster sugar with the gooseberries, no sugar at all, but drizzle elderflower cordial oh. over the gooseberries. Roll them around a little bit in it um, before you put them in your Pyrex. And of course, the perfect crumble has to be baked in a Pyrex. Of course, of course. And the thing about crumble is that if you've got a young family, the kids can get involved, can't they? They love just scrunching yeah. up all the ingredients. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You can't go wrong. It's not like a souffle or something that's going to go flat if you get it wrong. You can you can do what you like with the crumble, can't you? Absolutely. And oh my goodness, getting young people involved in cooking, brilliant. What we can learn from it is, is, is just, just awesome. This is absolutely delicious. Thank you so much, Paul. And as you say, check out our website because Paul's recipe will be on there. Now, Paul, much as you love cooking, because obviously you have been a restaurateur for many years, even you need a night off sometimes. So when you do decide to treat yourself and eat out, where do you go? I mean, who can live up to your own standards of cooking? Everybody can. Everybody can. I love home cooking. Um, we cook a lot at home. Um, and I think you can find enjoyment in loads of restaurants. There's an Indian restaurant in Marlow called Vasu. Um, and I believe the chefs uh, at Old Culture. And um, they did this halibut dish there with, with some fresh ginger. It was so fragrant and so beautiful. So that was really great. There's a fish and chip shop, which I think is called Harrison's, just outside Oxford in Botley. And there, Haddock and chips is fantastic, but they also do haken chips, mm. um, very sustainable fish from Cornwall, fantastic and proper fish and chip shop chips. Paul, there's a bit of a running theme here with all these fish dishes that you're talking about. First of all, you said mackerel. Now you're talking about your favourite chippy. Are you a big fish fan? Oh, I love cooking fish and I didn't realise that I'd, I'd given shout outs to um, Atoll's uh, halibut and ginger fish and chips. Fish and chips, though, um, I, I, we, we're, we're catering at a brilliant festival uh, called Trad in July on the riverbank in Henley. And um, we have a pop-up crooked billet and bar there. And my biggest seller is haddock and chips. Um, I've got a, a, a nice menu with crispy duck and salt beef. Oh, I like salt oh, beef. Lovely. With pickled wally, you know, the big pickled cucumber, um, some veggie dishes. A sea bass with an avocado puree and heirloom tomatoes and fancy chefy words. Oh, it sounds delicious. But fish and chips, that's our biggest seller. Always the way, always the way. And of course, back to your musical roots, because there's loads of music at Tradfest, isn't there? Oh my goodness, yeah. Um, we've got a, a quite incredible uh, local musician who's opening the festival called Art Themen. Um, incredible player. Um, uh, big regular at Ronnie Scott's and you know Cream, Eric Clapton's mm. band well before Eric joined Cream um, uh, um, Art was in in that band so he's opening the festival we've got Creedence Clearwater Revival um, that wonderful Tina Turner hit 
rolling down the river. Oh, I know. Well, that's Credence. Amazing. Credence wrote that. Local band from Reading called the Ding Dong Daddios. We've got the Blockheads, Ian Jury's old band. Amazing. So it's going to be a fun, fun festival. Great music, great food, and lots of people in Henley messing about on the river. What could be better? Let's just hope the weather holds out. Indeed. And Art Theman's going to be here and this very show coming up in a bit, bit later on. Thank you so much, Paul, for joining us. And, Thank you, Angie. Uh, and thanks for bringing this delicious food. Thank, Thank you. you, Angie. Well, you can find out more about Tradfest on the website at tradboatfestival.com. My next guest has performed at Tradfest. He's a jazz saxophonist and he's been playing the jazz circuit for more than 50 years. It's Art Themen. Art, thank you so much for joining us today. More than 50 years. Tell us about one of the highlights of your career because you've been playing for such a long time. Is it even possible to pick just one? It's tricky actually over the 50 years. Um, one of the two things that come to mind, I did Hyde Park concert with Jack Bruce, which is not really jazz, but it was, uh, yeah, that was one. I played at the Chicago Jazz Festival some years back, opposite yeah, one of the more famous, Stanley Turrentine, one of my heroes. And I suppose one of the memorable things was, was doing a recording um, it was uh, with a little help from my friends, Joe Cocker. Um, so it, that made a number one. So it's, that's the only number one pop record I was. But it was, you know, it wasn't a sort of that memorable. I was just a studio musician. But there, yeah, lots of things over the years. Amazing. And so, what is it that you love about playing the sax so much that you've committed so much of your life to it? Uh, well, I started, I suppose, on the clarinet and the saxophone. Um, it's a rather amusing story because I was a, a sort of traditional jazz clarinet player and I went to hear Johnny Dankworth who was, who was a very famous big band and among his musicians was a chap called Danny Moss and Danny was a very handsome chap and uh, I was in the audience with my 16 year old uh, Irish cousin <laughs> I think I was 15 at the time and of course he was way out of my, my sort of my um, sort of orbit in terms of maturity mm -hmm. and Danny Moss looked at my beautiful Irish cousin and winked and she melted and I thought I'm going to give up the clarinet I'm going to give up the, I'm going to take up the saxophone <laughs> so this, this is actually a tr yes. semi-true story that's actually. very funny I want to ask you about the benefits of music and mental health because I know that during lockdown you really found being able to play the saxophone just just so useful for your mental health and to help other people, didn't you? I live in a cul-de-sac and everybody knows we were all sort of stuck on our doorsteps and you couldn't move out but I, I got outside on my doorstep and played six nights a week really for for about four months but it did actually bring everybody together because it's music is is all embracing it's part of it's part of life and you know certainly it made our little lane a community there are even people coming at the end of the lane sort of um, socially distanced of course but um, and the other thing about about that is that um, you're talking about mental health about three weeks ago there's a very famous um, rock drummer. He was a, he was a rock drummer in Jethro Tull's band, and the poor chap has not been as well as he could have been lately. So three of our local musicians, Andy Crowdy and uh, Denny Eilert, guitar player, we went round round to his house and played with him. And he has a drum set in his house, and he was just suddenly he was he was a sort of back to sort of 20 years previously so it is it's therapeutic yes it's life it can give you such a lift and you mm. know covid and it was such a hard time for everyone and mm. people must have really looked forward to that you know throwing open their front door yeah. standing on the doorstep and hearing yeah. you on your saxophone i felt lovely. a bit sorry for them actually because obviously i'm um jazz musician so it was largely jazz i'd throw in the occasional <laughs> Beatles tune or Elvis Presley, but they were the poor the poor people were subjected to sort of uh, daily or six <laughs> days a week to jazz. But I think I think it was uh, yeah I think it was enjoyable. I'm sure we they all looked it. forward to it. I'm actually. sure they loved it. Yeah. Well, let's have a listen to one of your hit numbers. <laughs> was just lovely and uh, I know that you're coming to Maidenhead to play soon uh, tell us a bit about that uh, yes it's an art centre uh, Norden Farm 
And I play there a couple of times a year. The chap who does the booking is a wonderful pianist called Alex Hutton. And he's kindly asked me to uh, to play there. I'll be playing also with Andy, I mentioned I mentioned earlier, the bass player. Um, and it's it's a, a small theatre, probably a capacity of about 200. And it's one of those local gigs that I always look forward to. Yeah, it's yeah. a lovely venue. I've been yeah. there many times. Mm -hmm. I've seen comedy and drama and, yeah. and music. Yeah. And it's a nice atmosphere at Northern yeah. Farm, isn't it? Yeah. And it's not just Northern Farm. You, you're touring as well, aren't you? I'm all over the place. Um, tonight I'm <laughs> playing in Loughborough. And then the day after that, I think it's the Bull's Head Barns. Um, but it's, you know, it's what I do. And you, you sometimes, I sometimes divorce myself from it and think, what on earth are you doing, you know, blowing down a metal tube? And, but <laughs> you, at the end of the evening, it's, you know why you do it. because well, it's, yeah. earlier you said to me, you're in your 80s now. I'm in my 80s now. How long are you going to keep playing for? Well, as, um, I have several people, several people in the wings. It's, um, I think you have to have insight as to whether or not you're still cutting the mustard. And touch wood, maybe, maybe I'm still managing, but um, I think at the Glasgow Empire in the days of, uh, of um, you know, the theatre, um, they used to have somebody with a shepherd's crook in the in the in the wings, and they'd they'd hook the person off the stage Is if he wasn't true? So I've got several people with <laughs> shepherd's crooks to just stop me from playing if I'm no longer cutting the mustard. I yeah. think you're going to be playing yeah. for a long time, Art. That's very kind, Angie. So Art, you've brought your beautiful saxophone with you today. And uh, it's such a lovely piece, isn't it? Can you tell me about it? It's just yeah. lovely. Well, it's very kind of you to say it's beautiful. It's it's rather rather careworn, but it has been used a lot. And it's actually, its provenance is, is remarkable because a couple of years ago, I got a phone call from a chap who runs a music, ran a music shop in Oxford. And he said, Arch, you came into my shop about um, 15 years ago. And you bought a saxophone from me. I said, I remember it very well. It's a lovely Italian saxophone. And I also remember you had in a glass case, not for sale, two instruments, one owned by Tubby Hayes and the other owned by Ronnie Scott, the both of the preeminent saxophone players of their mm. day. And he said, yes, I sold the Tubby Hayes one, but um, I'm about to retire and I want to, you know, I want this uh, Ronnie's instrument to go to a good home. So I'm ringing round. And I said, how many people have you rung? He said, you're the first. I said, I'll have it. He was obviously a, a hard-nosed businessman, mm -hmm. as evidenced by a sign on his shop window, uh, sh 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 on, it, on, the, on the window, saying, warning, prices may vary according to the attitude of the customer. <laughs> but he sold it to me for the going rate. And given oh. its provenance, it was you know, a wonderful gesture. So. It is lovely. It does look a bit worn, but it's got such a history, and yeah. it must have seen so many things and all the da all the clubs absolutely. that this instrument's been played yeah, in. Goodness absolutely. knows. Anyway, it's just lovely. Thank you for showing it. Thank okay. you for bringing it in today. Oh, all thank right. you. Now, if you fancy a couple of days in the countryside, you're in the right place. You could win an overnight stay at Minster Mill in the Cotswolds. It's in Whitney, in 65 acres of gardens and meadows and alongside the River Windrush. To enter the competition, go to our website roundandabout.co.uk. Terms and conditions apply. Now, we love to hear what you've been up to and you've been having some amazing days out from the looks of it because Ellie Cox joins us in the studio now to talk through some of the highlights of what you've been up to across the South East. Thanks for joining us. Now you've been going through all of these messages and photos that people have been sending mm -hmm. on social media. What have people been getting up to? So the first image comes in from Michelle in Bracknell who had the Berkshire Reptile Encounters visit her at her home for her son's birthday party. They offer loads of reptile handling services, so everything's on their website and it sounds like they had a great time. Lovely. They come every year to the Charville Village Fete and they okay. bring all of these um, massive pythons yeah. and small snakes and all these kind of things and you, it's really hands-on, isn't it? Yeah, it looks great. So. Sounds like they had a lot of fun. And the next image is from Peter in Didcot. So he actually went to see the Red Arrows at the um, the Midland Air Show last weekend. Uh, they had loads of hot air balloon rides, the aircraft displays. You could walk around and see the exhibitions and go on loads of rides. So Amazing. that looked like a lot of fun. Love an air show. And then the next image comes from Steve uh, um, in Guildford. He went to Grey's Court in Henley on Thames. Loads that you can do there. You can see the walled gardens, walk around the estate, visit the shop that's actually on site. So it sounds like he had a great time. 
Um, and then we had Jenny from Wallingford. She sent us quite a few images actually. So the first one, she went to Longleat Centre Parks with her family. Always love Centre Parks, that's a good one. Um, she also visited the Harcourt Arboretum in Oxford and also saw some otters at Field Park in Reading as well. Oh, lovely. Well, Jenny's been busy. And she has. There's some amazing places that you've just mentioned, which are just really great family days. Yeah, and really good in the summer as well for the sort of summer holidays approaching as well. Perfect. Thanks so much, Ellen. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, don't forget to get in touch. We'd love to see pictures of what you've been up to. So find us on Instagram. We are Round and About Mag, and you could feature in our next video podcast. That's all we've got time for today. We'll have more dazzling guests and more chances to win great prizes in the next episode of Spotlight. Meanwhile, check out our website, roundandabout.co.uk, for more events around the region and more chances to win. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Check out our YouTube channel, Round and About Magazine. Until next time, it's goodbye from me and all my guests.